Good morning. Good to see the Wagners here. Yeah, fresh from the missions field. Uh, encourage everyone to say a socially distanced hi to them. Uh, just wanted to let you know I, I used uh, one of your Facebook posts in uh, one of my lessons that I did earlier. So <laughs> thanks for your contribution. <clears throat> All right, so my name is Greg Smith. I'm one of the elders here at New Century, and uh, this morning I'm going to share to you uh, from the Word uh, some thoughts about generosity. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to ask the question, how many of you in here, by show of hands, uh, remember the game, i got to look it up, um, the game called Chain Reaction. It was on the Game Show Network. I see one person. All right, I'm going to have to explain the game. All right, so here's how it works. Uh, the game starts with a specific word. Uh, we'll use the word shoe. All right, so it starts with the word shoe, and there's seven words in this uh, chain to get to the bottom word, bone. All right, so you got shoe, you got bone, and you have to link the words together to get to this bottom word. So the way it would work would, you would take the first word and you would come up with another word that goes along with it. So for example, store. So shoe, store goes together, right? So now we take store, and we have to link that one with another word. So if we say store, and we add the word front. Okay, so now we take front and door, front door. And now we take door, lock, lock, jaw, and jaw, bone. So we get the, the link from shoe down through bone. Now, that doesn't really have anything to do with anything, except for the fact that I'm kind of going to do the same thing with generosity. What we're going to do is we're, we're going to try to go through and we're going to link generosity through Paul's letters. And we're going to do that through a means of, first I'm going to talk about some, some Jewish storytelling. And then we're going to look at the first recorded war in the Bible. Okay, so we're going to link these things together uh, and, and come up with some points on generosity based on uh, some principles that, that we find in his word. All right, so <clears throat> first of all, we want to say that the New Testament writers have quite a bit to say about money, giving, and generosity. So the, the link between Paul's epistles and generosity is obviously there, but we've got to fill in these other links. All right, so <clears throat> we, we have to understand that uh, culture and writing style are super important whenever we're looking at reading the Bible. All right, when we want to find out what a, a true interpretation of something is, we need to open the word and look at it through the eyes of the culture that it was written in and from the writer and the writer's style so that we can truly understand what they're trying to get across. So those two terms are super important. The passages in the Bible have one true interpretation, but they might have several applications. So our goal in studying the scriptures is to find out what the writer is trying to say, which is interpretation, and then, from there, we make changes in our lives to align to that understanding. That's application. All right, so the two different things there. Interpretation, there is one true interpretation. Applications, we can pull multiple things from that one true interpretation. So that's what we're going to do this morning. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to say it's probably safe to say that most people in this room have heard the word rabbi. If you haven't, I'll help you out. Rabbi was used 16 times in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 16 times the word rabbi was used. The word simply means teacher. But did you know, if we dig a little deeper into Jewish culture, that we can find another office. One kind of like rabbi, but just a touch different. It's called Majid Mishirim. We call it Majid for short. And the Majid are ordained storytellers in the Jewish community. They originated, the official office originated in the 16th century. All right, so the reason I tell this is because rabbis focus on academics and theology, and the Majid focus uh, on moral and social issues. So they would weave together stories. They would use folklore, um, you know, different myths. Uh, they would use scripture sometimes, and they would take these things, and they, and they would put them together, and they, they would weave together a story that would teach some type of, morality code or teach some type of social issue that they were currently facing. <clears throat> so we've got the rabbi who focus on theology and we have the majid who focuses on moral and social issues. The rabbi primarily uses scriptures while the majid use 
all kinds of different types of things. All right, so why do I tell you that? Well, the reason that we, we talk about the Majid is because uh, the storytelling in the culture of the Hebrew people goes all the way back. It didn't, didn't just start with the Majid in the, in the late 1500s. It was hundreds and thousands of years before that. As a matter of fact, Moses commanded the people of Israel three separate times while they were in the exodus of Egypt. So while they were leaving Egypt, Moses commanded the people of, of Israel to tell the story. And this was even before, this was while they were camped on the shores of the Red Sea, before they had crossed over, while Pharaoh was still pursuing them. So they weren't even totally free yet. And Moses is already telling them, tell the story. But in Exodus chapter 12, 26 to 27, it says, And it will come about when your children will say to you, What does this right mean to you? Then tell them, tell the story. It's a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passes over the house of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And then the next chapter in Exodus 13, 80 says, And you shall tell your son, tell the story to your son on that day, saying, It's because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And then a few verses later, he says it again, And it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? Then you shall tell him, With a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. So we see three times before they're even delivered from Pharaoh, Moses is telling them, tell the story. Story is ingrained in the Hebrew tradition. Their meals, their festivals, everything is focused, centered around the storytelling of what they've been through, of where they've come, of how God has rescued them. <clears throat> There's a contemporary rabbi, his name's uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. He said this about the Exodus story. He said, it gave the Jews the most tenacious identity ever held by a nation. In the eras of oppression, it gave hope of freedom. At times of exile, it promised return. It told 200 generations of Jewish children who they were and of what story they were a part of. It became the world's master narrative of liberty. It was adopted by an astonishing variety of groups from Puritans in the 17th century to Afri African Americans in the 19th and to Tibetan Buddhists today. 200 generations. Think about that. 200 generations of identity held together about the story of God's rescue from Egypt. Story is completely ingrained. And the, the reason why I, I keep going back to that and why, why I talk about stories, because when we, like I said, when we study Scripture, we need to look at it from, from the cultural perspective that it was written in. And, and that culture is different than our culture. We like our, our stories a specific timeline, you know, chronological order. Um, that's not always the case in Jewish storytelling because Jew Jewish storytelling is always fresh and always new and is, is different. <clears throat> so we've got another quote uh, from Jerome Bruner. Now this man was an American Jewish psychologist and he helped form the cognitive learning theory in educational psychology. So this man dedicated his life to learning, learning behaviors. And he was talking about story here. And I've got this quote should be able to put it up on the board. He said, No computer needs to be persuaded of its purpose in life before it does what it's supposed to do. Genes need no motivational encouragement. No virus needs a coach. We do not have to enter the mindset to understand what they do and how they do it because they do not have a mindset to enter. But humans do. All right, get this point right here. We act in the present because of things we did or that happened to us in the past, and in order to realize a sought-for future. I'm going to read that part again. Because we act in the present because of things we did or that happened to us in the past, and in order to realize a sought-for future. And then he says, even minimally to explain what we are doing is already a story. So you can see in the Jewish life, story is everything. They go back to it time and time again. And when he was talking about his Jewish heritage, he went on and he said, we are the story that we tell about ourselves. Then as long as we never lose the story, we will never lose our identity. Again, storytelling is a deep, deep, deep-rooted part of the Hebrew people. Let me give you a list of uh, some famous actors that we've got here. I'm going to read off a list. I've got Steven Spielberg, J.J. Abrams, Jerry Lewis, James Franco, John Favreau, which he did the uh, Avengers series. Um, my daughter really likes that one. 
Michael Bay, Leonard Nimoy, Natalie Portman, Ben Stiller, Barbara Streisand, Daniel Radcliffe, Michael Douglas. These are all famous people that we love to watch in our movies because the, the movies that they make and, and the stories that they create are so rich that they've got several different times that, that we can watch through them. And they, all of these people are of Jewish her heritage. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. Hollywood is filled with Jewish story creators. Story is a huge part of their culture. And as we see when we look at the scripture, that plays an important role. We need to make sure that we keep that in mind as we look through scripture. All right, so you might be thinking, why is that important? Well, let's get in here. We'll, we'll take a look at it. So let's turn to our uh, Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 13. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 13, and before we start reading, um, I'm going to pray for God uh, to bless us, uh, to bless me that uh, I can share his word clearly with you. Uh, so let's, let's pray together. Father God, we just come before you humbled, Lord, just thankful that uh, you have given your word to us, Lord. Thank you that you've preserved it through time that we can know what is in your heart, in your mind. God, we pray that uh, you would just uh, bless your, the reading of your word today, Lord. Help me to be faithful in preaching your truth. God, I pray that you would just send your spirit, that he would guide us, Lord, that he would help us change, Lord. Help us to um, not be the man who looks in a mirror and walks away and forgets what he looks like, Lord. But when we look into your word, help us to, to see things <clears throat> that need to change, that need to adapt, Lord, and help us do those. Uh, Father, I pray that you bless our time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 13. <clears throat> not, uh, Chase was telling me, he's like, he's like, you're pretty brave to uh, talk about generosity out of uh, Genesis 13 and 14, but, uh, but we're going to give it a shot. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of backstory what happened in uh, chapter 12. Basically, this is the call of Abram. Uh, Abram was in the land of Ur the Chal Chaldeans, and uh, God comes to Abram, says, separate yourself out from your family, get away from the people that you know, get away from whatever it is that you're doing in that city, um, separate yourself out, go to a land that I will tell you, uh, and I will give you um, that land, and I will make promises to you. <clears throat> so um, Abram... Also, in this situation, uh, had a nephew, nephew who was orphaned. Um, his name was Lot. Abram took him along with him. Uh, they walked around the, the land, uh, saw places where God said he was going to give him different, different pieces of the land, and then uh, there was a famine, so Abram goes down to Egypt to, uh, to avoid the famine. While he's in Egypt, he tells a lie to Pharaoh, says that uh, Sarah is his sister, not his wife. Um, because he was scared that Pharaoh would, would want her for himself and would kill him. So he lied about it. Um, God prevented uh, Pharaoh from having Sarah, uh, gave Sarah back, kicked them out of Egypt, said, why'd you lie to me, and sent them on their way. So uh, they're heading back up into <clears throat> the South Country, which is where we pick up in chapter 13. And the first point that we're going to look into uh, in Genesis chapter 13 First thing we're going to talk about is we want to, point number one, accept less to settle a dispute. Again, first point is accept less to settle a dispute. So Genesis chapter 13, so Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the Negeb. Now, just a real quick side note, Negeb uh, is just a terminology for South Country. So it's kind of like a, a local term, kind of like if we said uh, Old Southwest here in Roanoke. Everyone will know what we were talking about. So the same thing there in the Negev is just the south country there. Uh, so they go into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock in verse 2, in silver and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord, and Lot who went with him also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock at the time the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. <clears throat> and then in verse 8, we see, Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. 
And Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the uh, direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 11, so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in, among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. So again, the point, accept less to settle dispute. Abram allowed Lot to choose the best land. And they were there together, the herdsmen were having conflict. He said, hold on, we need to fix this. You pick whatever part you want, and I'll take whatever's left over. We see this in Paul's writings, in 1 Corinthians 6, 7. Paul says to the church in Corinthians, he says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? So again, we see Paul's thinking, he's ingrained in these stories that he has, and he already has these principles drawn up, and when he's sharing them with the church in Corinthians, he's He's saying the same thing. Why not be like Abraham whenever there's a conflict? Why not settle for a little less to keep peace? Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated than to destroy the unity of the body? All right, so then we get into uh, verse, uh, get into uh, chapter 14, and the first part, about the first 10 verses or so of chapter 14, uh, those are they're pretty difficult. I, I could take a whiteboard up here and I could write down all the different names of the kings and kind of do a little circle gram and like who's allied with who, but I, I thought I would just uh, sum it up for you in a quick semi, uh way here. So first of all, we've got nine kings, nine kings total in the first 10 verses. We've got five kingdoms of the west, and we have four kingdoms of the east. And basically what's happening is the five kingdoms from the west for 12 years have been paying tribute to the kingdoms from the east. All right, so we've got these five little bit smaller kingdoms. When we talk about kingdoms, um, you need to think of it as not like these, these huge kingdoms like, you know, going to war like, uh, you know, America versus China or something like that. You need to think of it more like um, some of the medieval movies uh, where you got Vikings and the the English kind of going at the skirmishes of a few hundred people. That's, that's more like what we're speaking about here. Uh, but we've got these five kings that for 12 years paid tribute to these four kings. And in the 13th year, they said, you know what? We're tired of, tired of paying tribute. We're not doing it anymore. No more tribute. We're keeping our own money. You can't have it. Well, obviously that didn't sit well with the four kings. And in the 14th year, they said, all right, we're going to do something about it. We're going to go in. We're going to take what's ours. You should have been paying this. We didn't tell you you could stop. We're going in. We're taking it. So that brings us up into <clears throat> verse 11 and into our second point. Our second point is help those in need around you, even if their own decisions led to their problem. So in chapter 14, verse 11, it says, So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and went their way. Then the one who escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, who was the brother of Ishkel and of Aner. These were the allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan, and he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and, and pursued them to Hobo, north of Damascus. And he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman, Lot, with his possessions and the women and the people. <clears throat> now, I left out a little bit of, of chapter 13, and we're going to go back and we're going to look at that real quick um, so we can kind of see what's going on. Basically, at the end of chapter 13, in verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, so this is after they separated, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land that you see, I will give you, and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that one of you can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, 
for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. So the backstory of this second point of Abram going in and rescuing Lot <clears throat> was that when they separated, when Abram separated from Lot, when he said, Lot, you choose the best land, choose whatever land you want, whether it's the best, worst, whatever, whatever you want, I'll take whatever's left. Once Abram separated from Lot, that's when God came and gave his promise of blessing. So when he heard that Lot was taken off into battle, was captured, he could have sat back and thought, you know, I think that was God's plan. You know, because it wasn't until we separated, we went separate ways that God gave me his promises. It wasn't until Lot went off and decided to move to Sodom until God said he would fulfill these things for me. So maybe it's God's plan. Or he could have said, I told Lot not to move to the city. You know, he could take the land but stay out there. It's his own decisions that led to that. Again, Paul could have been thinking about these things in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. So Paul, reflecting on what Abram, or might have been reflecting on what Abram did in this passage, where he said, I know God has promised me these things, but I'm going to risk everything. I'm going to risk my life to go assist someone who has made a poor decision that has left himself vulnerable to being captured. Now, I want to be clear, we're not talking about enabling. We're not talking about someone who is continuously making bad decisions and you're funding their bad behavior. We're not talking about that. We're talking about someone who's down to their luck that, you know, you, you've got the unique ability to help restore that person. Don't hold back from them. All right, point number three is give generously to the Lord. Point number three, give generously to the Lord. So in verses 17 of chapter 14, we read, after his return from the defeat of uh, Chedor Leomor <coughs> and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Abram gave him a tenth of everything. He tithed everything he had to Melchizedek. And just like in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, where Paul, again to the Corinthian church, talks about how that each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And we think, can think back to the story of Ananias and Sapphira, to where they gave a lot, and they gave a lot more than a tenth. They sold a piece of property, and they gave quite a bit of money so that the church could flourish. But they didn't give with a cheerful heart. They gave for whatever reason, whatever motive it was, if it was uh, to look good, to look like the other people that were selling their stuff and giving it, or, or you know, to, to make a name for themselves or, or to, to gain reputation, whatever the reason was, they, they weren't giving it with a cheerful heart. So when we give, when we give to the Lord, when we give our tithes, when we give our offerings, we need to make sure that we are doing it cheerfully. That it's not a, uh, got to write this tithe again or Pastor Chase is going to yell at me. You know, we need to give cheerfully to the Lord. All right, so the next uh, passage has two points in it, so I'll go ahead and give you both points. Uh, point number four, bless those who work with you. And point number five, have the right attitude about money. So again, point number four, bless those who work with you. And point number five, have the right attitude about money. So let's pick up in verse 21. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, 
Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. So he's giving him a business proposition here. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you say I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner and Eshkel and Mamre take their share. Those are the, the allies where he was camped, if you remember. So he's saying, I don't want anything of yours. But he wants to make sure that the men went with him were paid. So bless those that work with you. In Romans chapter 4, Paul again is writing. In Romans chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And if you actually go back and look at that chapter, the first three verses, he's actually talking about Abraham in Romans chapter 4. So I'm sure it's fresh in his mind about how that he paid, made sure that the, the men that helped him were paid. So the, the point here is, if you're an employer, treat your employees fairly. If you hire someone to do something, if you say, hey, I'll pay you 500 bucks if you come paint my house. And then you say, well, it doesn't look as good as I hoped. Here's 400. You know, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. Pay people what you say that you were going to pay people. And then the second one was have the right attitude about money. And in 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 10, he says, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. I'm going to read that last part again because it gets misinterpreted a lot. A lot of times it's said, for the love of money is the root of all evil. That is not case. It's not what scripture says. It says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. All right. There's a distinction there. <clears throat> it's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And I was thinking about this, having the right attitude about money. And I was thinking back and <clears throat> a lot of times I, I remember examples of, I could hear uh, missionaries talk about how that a, a need would come up and they would, they would need a certain amount or uh, when I went to Bible college, there was a, a, a guy that gave testimony about how that uh, one time his, his car broke down and he needed $613 to, to fix his car. And he didn't have it. And he had no idea where it was going to come from. So he gets down on his knees and he prays to God. He's like, God, I need $613 to fix my car. I know that you're going to supply it. And then the next day, he goes to his mailbox. What do you think's in there? Some, some anonymous person gave him $613. And I'm like, why doesn't that happen to me? <laughs> it's like, seriously, it's like, okay, so all these people, <clears throat> they have this financial need and God meets the need. And then I started thinking about it, about the right attitude of money, and, and I realized that's not what, they weren't talking about money. They were talking about how God enriched their faith. And I realized it's my attitude about money. I was looking at that story as, God's paying all these people. He's not paying me. What's the problem? <clears throat> but the fact is, they were talking about faith. I was thinking about money. I have the right attitude about money. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am a natural saver. I can't help it. It's compulsory. I have to save. So let me tell you a story. When I was, when I was six, seven years old, something like that, um, I had a, a, an album, a baseball card album. And if you remember them, they had the, like the little plastic clear sheets that had like several different pockets that you could put your baseball cards in. I had those in for, for birthdays, Christmas, things like that. I would get some money, and instead of going and buying baseball cards to put in there, I'd put the money in the slots. <laughs> yeah. I'd take the dollars, I'd fold them up, I'd stick, the, I'd stick them in the slots. And I'd go through, I'd go through every once in a while, and I'd turn the pages, and I'd look at my crisp dollar bills in those slots, and I'd be like, yeah. All right. So I'm a saver. Tell you another story. So <clears throat> a couple years ago, my wife uh, bought me some, some jerky for Christmas, just like a little stocking stuffer type of thing. Uh, there was like one was bison jerky with cranberries. The other one was like a reindeer with uh, blueberries or something like that. Like these, these really nice gourmet jerky type of things. I'm like, man, that, that's tough. I'd, I'd love these. And uh, 
<clears throat> a few months go by, and they're in the drawer, and I walk by, and I'm like, hey, someone ate my jerky. I mean, one of the kids was like, well, it had been in there for months. I was like, that's not the point. You understand, I enjoy my snacks knowing that someday I could eat them. <laughs> so that's me. That's, I, like, I like to say, that's what I do. <clears throat> and so looking at the finances from the perspective of these uh, missionaries or, or the college student that said, hey, I needed some money and God provided it. God doesn't work that way with me because he knows that in that situation, I'm just going to keep cutting and keep uh, finding a way to get expenses down, to, to save up, to, to, to pay for something. You know, the kids would be like, can we please stop eating rice for months on end? Uh, God's not going to work that, that way with me. He works in a different way with my attitude towards money. So my way, <clears throat> and I can tell you, it can be a bit frustrating. But as I see money that I think is about to come in, something always happens. And when I say always, I mean it's like clockwork every single time. So let's say, for example, Congress decides that they're going to give everybody $600. And they're going to give people that have kids $600 for those. So I've got a wife and three kids. That's five times six. That's $3,000. So I'm like, sweet. $3,000 coming my way. <clears throat> well, got two cars, need to get repaired, $1,500 each. There it goes. I work, uh, I get paid every other week at work, so there's twice a year. There's two months during the year where I get an additional paycheck. And I'll be like, all right, honey, we got an extra $800 coming in this month. Uh, you know, let's do something exciting. She'd be like, all right, how's, ex how's this for exciting? Uh, we had an eye appointment the other day, and two kids needed glasses, and two of us got contacts for six months, and it was about 800 bucks. I'm like, come on. <laughs> I got one more. <clears throat> yeah. It's, I'm telling you, it's constant. Uh, so not, this, well, not 2020, because 2020 stinks, uh, but 2019, uh, for work, man, it was, it was a great year. I, I work on commission, so if any of you work on commission kind of knows what this is like, you, you might do well, might hit 110, 120%, something like that, but then your goal gets raised, and then you underachieve, and you hit you know, 80, 85%, something like that, then your goal comes down a little bit. So throughout the course of the year, if you're working commission, you're probably going to get about 95% to 105% of whatever your pay should have been. So that's just kind of the way commission works. Well, in 2019... <clears throat> Man, it was a great year. I had the, the, the market that, that I worked through was, was doing great. Stores were open all over the place. Um, my numbers were looking great. It was the best year I ever had. Yeah, well, um, we had, it seemed like every time I got a decent commission check, I had to replace a tire from a nail. And there's people in here, man, they, they heard my story. They were like, man, how how's this keep happening to you? Not including repairs, I'm talking replacements of tires. In 2019, we bought 14 tires. Continuously. It's like every time, it's like, all right, good commission check, let's buy a tire. So every time that there's a windfall of money or some additional resources come in, God is saying, I'm going to give you an opportunity to separate yourself out and to realize this is a resource I've given you to bless your church, to bless your family. It's not for you to hoard, to put in these sleeves and to look at and to be proud of. It's a resource. So we need to be careful about the attitude that we have about money. <clears throat> now I talked in the, the beginning about Hebrew storytelling and how it's so important. And there's kind of a little bit of an ulterior motive in that um, because I wanted to circle back around and I wanted to look at this story one more time from a di different perspective. And realize that the Hebrew storytelling, again, as we circle back around and we look at these things, we've got one more thing that we can pull from this passage. If we go back in Genesis chapter 13, Lot chose the greener valley, Genesis chapter 13. And he moved closer and closer to Sodom until he found himself in the city. Abram stayed out, stayed separate. A lot of times when we read scripture, we want to put ourselves in the place of the hero. We want to be David, who took the stone and killed Goliath. We want to be Abram, who was generous, paid his men well, who rescued Lot. 
but most of the time, we're lost. We're the one that needs rescued. Lot chose the greener valley. He saw it could have, it would have been to his favor to have better land. Better land means better cattle. Better, better cattle probably means more wealth. Somewhere between chapter 13 and 14, Lot moved into Sodom, where it was exceedingly wicked. It might have been out of the conveniences that the city provided. Maybe the vibrant nightlife, there was more to do. Maybe it was more profitable to sell his livestock and he didn't have to commute back and forth. Maybe he saw opportunities for his family that they wouldn't have in the wilderness. Whatever his reason, whatever, however wholesome or, or well-meaning his reasons were, he finds himself, in chapter 14, he's a captive and he has no hope for the future. He has no say over what's going to happen to him. He's a prisoner of war. In contrast, Abram was not drawn into the war. When a captured man escaped and told Abram what was going on, he was quick to respond. And the Hebrew language captures Abram's leadership better than our English does. Our English, in the, in the verse that we read, let's see if I can find it real quick. <clears throat> When Abram, verse 14 of Genesis chapter 14 says, When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them. Led forth his men. That seems pretty mundane to us, but the Hebrew language kind of captures it more. It says, he drew out his men. Like someone drawing out a sword. Or he gave courage to his men. He mustered his men. So Abram wasn't going into this reluctantly. Abram sprang to action. Abram went from peaceful shepherd to general in pursuit of Lot. And Abram's actions point to someone else. They point to a greater, a braver hero. Abram rescued Lot how Jesus rescues us. While Abram went in the risk of his life, Christ came and gave his life. While Abram thought about his promises that he might have left behind, Jesus came to be the promise for us. We are Lot. We move closer and closer to sin, to our desires, to the lust of our flesh, to the pride of life. We move closer to those things and we become captive and we can't free ourselves. But Christ, like Abram, comes to rescue us. If you're like Lot, trusting in your own judgment, trusting in your own actions for a secure future, I plead to you, turn to Christ. He risked everything, paid for it with his life for your rescue. Let's pray. God, we just uh, thank you so much for your redeeming work on Calvary. God, we're lost without you, Lord. We, we make decisions. We, we think we're doing well by the choices that we make, the places that we go, the people that we become friends with, Lord. We we think that we are the ruler of our own kingdom, but the reality is we sink further and further away in need of rescue. And God, we just thank you so much that you've provided that rescue through your son, Jesus. God, I pray that you just enrich us with that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we're going to continue in musical worship this morning. We invite you to stand with us.